wanted to kind of create something that would help us kind of understand um, our role within the community and some of the work that we're doing specifically to carry out that role. Um, I also find that it's something that sometimes even our existing members have some questions about how things operate. Um, so this might be helpful just as much for returning members as it is for folks that are new to us. Um, so just starting with a, a basic definition of a continuum of care. Um, so basically, this is going to be a community-wide commitment with the goal of ending homelessness. Some of the things that would be included as part of that goal, we um, provide funding to nonprofit organizations to help implement work. Um, we would have a goal of trying to quickly rehouse individuals and families as they experience homelessness to reduce the trauma and dislocation that is caused when people experience homelessness. We also want to operate a system that is fair and equitable, um, that promotes access to resources in an effective way, and that ultimately moves persons towards self-sufficiency. Another way of framing this in a slightly more specific manner would be that this is our community's specific plan and system that's designated to meet the needs of persons who are experiencing homelessness. And what that's going to entail is that we are not only meeting the immediate need of shelter, but also moving people into permanent housing, that we are offering opportunities for supportive services, connecting people with things like opportunities for education and employment, um, that we are promoting access to mainstream benefit programs that can be a part of that plan for self-sufficiency and sustaining housing over time, um, but also that we should be focused on prevention strategies. How do we divert persons from entering our system altogether um, as a way of reducing our overall numbers and keeping people from experiencing that traumatic experience of homelessness? So who should be a part of the continuum of care? This can be something extremely broad. Most of the time, we're gonna see a lot of familiar faces in these meetings, and that's gonna be usually our core organizations that focus on homelessness or broader issues like poverty. Um, but there's many organizations and individuals who are welcome at the table. Essentially, anyone who has a stake in ending homelessness can and should be a part of this conversation. Homelessness is a community problem and requires a community solution. Um, some examples, we're gonna have victim services providers like Greenhouse 17, faith-based organizations. Obviously, um, LFUCG is the local government, serves as the lead agency for the continuum of care. Businesses can be a part of the continuum of care. Um, many of, in this room are going to identify as advocates. We have private citizens that aren't necessarily attached with an organization who have formally joined or who informally participate. Whoa, going to need to definitely stand back. Um, LHA is our local public housing agency and is involved in many of the conversations and work that we do. We have representation from the public school system. Um, T.C. Johnson with the McKinney Vento office sits on our board and helps make sure that we consider not just those experiencing literal homelessness, but those who also meet the Department of Education's definition. We have many social service providers who might operate a little bit on the periphery of homelessness itself. Maybe their core mission is serving individuals with serious mental illness or those that have disabling conditions but they understand the intersectionality of homelessness and are part of our conversations. We have several mental health care agencies like New Vista and Mountain Comprehensive Care Center that participate. We have um, hospitals that we often engage. Um, probably UK Healthcare is the one who's most involved in the continuum. Universities, we get a lot of support from universities in terms of things like um, operating our annual point in time count, and from time to time, we partner with universities to conduct research or other efforts. Affordable housing developers, it's definitely somebody that we could use a little bit more of at the table, as I think all of us doing this work understand that a lot of the challenges we face come down to housing itself and the access to affordable housing in our community. Law enforcement also um, oftentimes works with us um, and as such are formal members of the Continuum of Care. 
We have veteran service providers serving individuals who are currently or formerly experiencing homelessness. And individuals themselves that have lived experience, we encourage and promote being a part of our work. Again, this would be really essentially anyone who has a stake in trying to prevent and end homelessness within our community. Um, and we always want to make sure that there's diverse representation on certain subpopulations. We want youth providers. We want victim services or DV providers. We want to have those that are working with veterans, those working with individuals with substance use. We want to have as, bright, as wide and broad of representation as we possibly can to make sure that we have solutions that are varied and broad. Several years ago, um, we engaged with um, Untold Content, a marketing team, um, to help us develop a continuum of care brand. Um, sometimes it is difficult to get people to see the efforts of the continuum as more than maybe oftentimes being framed as what the city is doing. Um, and this is a conscious effort to make sure that we're focusing on the broader continuum and not just specifically my office. Um, and part of that, we develop some clear mission statements and vision statements and values. Our mission, simply put, is to ensure that everyone in Lexington has access <coughs> to housing by building a coordinated strategy that brings hope and stability to all. Um, I've underlined coordinated strategy um, because coordination is key to what we do and it is the role of this office and the continuum to provide coordination and support to facilitate the programming and strategies that are needed to address homelessness. In terms of vision, we define that as being that everyone in Lexington should have a safe, stable home and the support that they need to thrive. As we are engaging in leadership and development of the LEH brand, um, it was important for us that we chose language that focused not just on meeting people's basic needs, um, but also looking at how we can help people to achieve self-sufficiency, to recover from the trauma of homelessness, um, and to truly thrive, not just survive. Moving into the values of the continuum of care, um, some of the cornerstones that we try to work by, um, we believe that at its core, homelessness is the solution to housing. We mentioned several times now the intersectionality of homelessness. We know that it touches many different other issues that people face that can be a part of their personal journey and how they might have arrived at a homeless situation, but those are not always necessarily the cause. At its core, homelessness is about people having a lack of access to affordable housing and a lack of supports who can help them when they experience crisis. We also believe in effectiveness. We want to develop a strategy that incorporates best practices um, that are implemented in the most effective way. And the way that we're able to gauge that is through examination of data. Um, we have made a conscious effort to do things not only to collect and analyze data, but to message it to the public, um, to make it very forward facing so that we can highlight the work that we're doing and the work that's still needed to be done. Some of our additional core beliefs are tied to our um, adoption and promotion of the Housing First model. Many of you are going to be familiar with that, um, but since we do have some new persons in the room, just wanting to review, um, this would include that persons should not have to demonstrate readiness for housing. Permanent housing should be the goal for all persons, regardless of where they are in their journey. Um, a lot of um, what systems like ours have done in the past was required that people went through a, a step process that first persons would have to go to emergency shelter, then they could graduate to transitional housing, then they could graduate to permanent housing. Um, sometimes we have to consider that there's not one linear path. It may not serve a particular individual well to be in an emergency shelter environment um, if that is not something that is going to be a good fit for where they are at that time. We also have to acknowledge that when we have um, programming like transitional housing, we have to have somewhere to transition folks to. Um, so be mindful of some of these challenges. We're really looking to move people to permanent housing as quickly as possible. Most issues that we would want to try to work with individuals or families to improve 
are going to be most improved through the provision of safe and stable housing. Also, there should be self-determination and client choice. Uh, I think most of us in this room acknowledge the fact that any change that someone wants to make is going to be much more impactful and much more successful if they choose it for themselves. When we develop a housing plan, when we develop a case management plan, we should be focusing on what the client wants to work on, what the individual is interested in, not what we as a provider are interested in necessarily. Um, and as much as possible, we should be trying to incorporate the voice of that client into that plan and make sure that if it no longer works for them, then we adjust that plan so that it does meet their needs. We operate with a recovery orientation, understanding that homelessness itself is traumatic, but so are a variety of other issues that people experiencing homelessness face. Um, it may be difficult at times, um, to see immediate progress in someone's situation, and we have to acknowledge the impact of trauma, how that can zap someone of their motivation, how it can produce barriers for them getting to their goals. And we have to actively work to try to promote a healthy environment for them and be the supports that can help them to recover. We also believe in individualized and client-driven supports, again, maximizing um, individual choice and making sure that individuals are able to get support in the things that they need, but are not necessarily guided to the particular answers that we want for them. And finally, we believe that there should be a social and community-oriented approach to homelessness. As a very small staff that just expanded to a staff of three, three of us sitting in, the, in a government building are not going to solve homelessness in Lexington. <laughs> it takes all of you around this table, and to be honest, we need to pack this room with more people before we're going to actually achieve that goal. Um, so we really want to maximize and highlight the fact that everyone has a role in the work that we do. I'm gonna just briefly kind of overview um, some of who is part of the continuum. Um, this is our current board. Um, so we have, I'm just going to go ahead and call up our board members here with us today. Um, obviously we did introductions, but we have Bo, the chair of this committee, um, Janice James, formerly with the Hope Center, Bruce Davis, Kathy Plowman with the Urban County Council. Am I missing anybody? No, I don't think so. Um, and we uh, just filled our last <laughs> Joy, right no, here. Right Joy and Trotty, we are really excited to have somebody who actually likes to deal with data um, and helps with our data and systems integration today. Um, and we recently just filled our last vacancy um, with a new individual who would join us at the next board meeting, meeting with her for more orientation next week. Um, Billy Love is a licensed clinical social worker um, who has a background in working with individuals specifically that have experienced trauma. Um, and so we're really excited to have her expertise and her input on our board. Briefly, just kind of capturing some of the many organizations who are part of the continuum of care. This kind of goes back to that slide of, of who should be a part of the continuum. And you're going to see a lot of those categories represented by the logos on this slide. So next, um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking through what the work of each of our committees does and how it relates to the work of the board itself. Um, this is probably the area that I get a lot of questions as someone is contemplating whether they want to be a, former, a formal member of the continuum of care. They often have questions around, okay, you have all these meetings, all these committees, which one should my organization or me as an individual, who should be at the table for which meetings? Um, so first, just outlining the three committees that we do have. Um, they, those are where the bulk of the work is going to be done, and then we're going to bring items back to our board um, for formal votes and to move things forward. Um, but we really need the voice and the support of our membership to break out into areas that can help us develop our strategies and our work. So on um, the first Wednesday of every other month, we have our Data and Systems Integration Committee. On the third Wednesday of every other month, we have Program Performance and Evaluation Committee. And then we would have on the fourth Wednesday of every other month, 
the Advocacy Issues and Programs Committee. All of those committees are gonna meet um, in the every other month starting with February, and then um, starting in January, we have board meetings that take place on the second Wednesday of every other month. <laughs> so um, that's where having a handy dandy calendar can come in handy because it is a little bit daunting at first to track all of that movement and know when and where to be from year to year. Sometimes we have meetings that we have to change our venue. Um, something might be booked well in advance. Um, so having something like that to reference is extremely helpful. We're going to go into what each of those committees does in more detail. So the Data and Systems Integration Committee was formerly our HMIS or Coordinated Entry Committee. It still deals a lot with those items. Um, HMIS being the Homeless Management Information System or the database that we are federally mandated to use. It helps us to track information about individuals and services within our system. Um, it's going to be our primary source for evaluating things like system gaps, effectiveness of programming, um, and then our coordinated entry system is going to be the mechanism or system that helps us to outreach persons, engage them in a common assessment tool, understand their needs, and link them to the right levels of housing and supportive services. So um, in addition to evaluating data and our system performance, that's where we're also trying to constantly think about how we can more effectively work with other systems um, to create a more integrated and unified overall community. The Program Performance and Evaluation Committee is going to be made up of board members um, who have a, a neutral role where they are not directly employed by an organization or serving on the board of an organization. They can help us to make um, our funding decisions um, when we have funds that are available. Um, they also are going to hold presentations of any programming that receives funds specifically to address homelessness from the city. Um, and so that process allows us to establish our mon and monitor performance targets. Um, we can look at individual programs, understand how they are performing when we have funds available in the future, knowing whether certain types of programs are worth us funding again in the future, um, knowing what organizations are able to execute certain work. Um, and that is something that also helps lead to conversations when we maybe don't meet a performance measure. What are the factors involved? Is this something at the programmatic level? Um, does the failure to reach an outcome mean that maybe there was a period where there was a gap in staffing? Or does the failure for us to meet that outcome measure really speak to more of a systematic issue? Is this something that other programs are facing and something that we need to try to develop community-wide solutions for? The Advocacy Issues and Programs Committee, got me again, um, <laughs> focuses on identifying system gaps or potentially taking um, potential gaps that are identified by our program performance and evaluation committee and moving those forward, doing more investigation, researching strategies or best practices, program models to address those <coughs> gaps, doing the work to develop those solutions. Um, that can include establishing funding priorities, determining what specific things that we want to put our funding behind in order to meet our goals, um, and developing our overall COC strategies. That committee is going to focus on advocacy efforts that might be um, advocating against something like House Bill 5, um, that might be um, just raising general awareness within the community so that we can gain the support of those that we need it from. Um, it could be our elected officials, or it could be individuals who might be able to help us tackle a particular issue that we're seeing. And then, because it still maybe be a little bit fuzzy, we're also just going to make some brief recommendations of types of people that might want to attend those individual committees. So data and systems integration is probably one of the committees that we sometimes struggle to get a lot of engagement in because some people don't like the word data. It makes them a little uncomfortable. Um, but what we really attempt to do in that committee is present data in a way that is hopefully accessible and understandable um, and that can inform our work and our decisions. 
Um, so definitely, if you have an interest or a background in data, it might be not only of interest to you, but you might be a helpful part of those conversations. It might be a good idea for folks that have a tie to other systems, like the healthcare system, to be a part of those conversations. Going back to the fact that this ties to how we operate our coordinated entry system, if there's somebody that can help us to better assess needs, to better um, gauge the acuity of needs, we want to have that conversation. Um, also, we would want folks who are members of leadership within organizations or systems that can help us to actually implement um, policies and practices or improve upon them to be a part of those conversations. For the Program Performance and Evaluation Committee, um, that's going to be a committee that would be probably ideal for program level staff. A lot of times when we're talking through how programs perform on our performance metrics, um, there can be a lot of useful conversations that are generated out of that. Maybe we are talking about um, whether or not a program met its income growth uh, measure. And maybe that's something that helps share resources between frontline staff um, that can be used in working with a variety of different clients or programs. It would also be um, a good committee um, for somebody who's maybe just interested in knowing more about kind of the frontline programs that we have and the work that they're doing. The Advocacy Issues and Programs Committee would be recommended for those that have an interest in engaging in advocacy efforts. Um, but also for those who might be wanting to bring a particular issue to our attention um, for the COC to work on developing solutions to address. Um, but also um, members that have experience with development or implementation of programs and policies who can help us once we've identified those gaps to fill <coughs> them. This slide's gonna be kind of hard to read at this size. Um, but it is an attempt to give you a breakdown of the annual COC timeline. This timeline is going to be specifically tied to our role as the collaborative applicant who develops our annual um, application for the Continuum of Care program. Um, in the first quarter, we're going to have things, and this is on a calendar year, this is where we really start the process of planning for the year. We're gonna go ahead and register with HUD for our intent to submit a new application this year. Um, and then we're gonna begin the work of building that application. It's gonna start with efforts to take stock of our available inventory of beds. That includes emergency shelter, transitional housing, permanent housing. And we're also gonna do at the same time our annual point in time count. While that is a static measure, it's looking at one fixed night. Um, it's not going to be something that is dynamic enough to tell us about fluctuations in homelessness across the entire year. It is something that helps us make longitudinal comparisons or comparisons to other communities. It's a good opportunity for us to gauge progress, understand what the needs of our population are at this given moment. Um, then next we're going to move into some other data sets in the spring, like our system performance measures. Um, we just reported out in the Data and Systems Integration Committee on some of the outcomes from our most recent submission. And then moving towards late spring, early summer, we are going to see the um, continuum of care process open up. HUD will release the notice of funding opportunity that's going to tell us what HUD's current priorities are. Um, how we're going to be evaluated as a community so that we can begin building an application that is as strong as possible um, that helps us to bring funding into the community. Um, usually we're going to open um, that competition progress in late summer, early fall. The NOFA is usually going to drop around June or July. Um, we are going to run an internal competition for our providers to apply for funding to directly operate programs. And then we are going to include funding recommendations of who we think should receive that funding and at what levels in an overall community application that frames that. And that's going to talk to our broader community strategies to preventing and ending homelessness. Then we're going to kind of close out the year by doing our final data submission to HUD, the longitudinal systems analysis. That is going to be something where we have the point in time count, which looks at one fixed night. 
the longitudinal systems analysis looks at our data throughout the entire year, and it helps us better understand things like the pathways that people take when they access our system. Are they entering from the streets? Are they entering through shelter? What resources are they touching along the way? What are the outcomes? Um, and then we're also going to get towards the end of the year, beginning of the next year, the results of our continuum of care application and understand at what level that our community was funded. So one of the things that I really want to make sure that we have new persons at the table for um, is gonna be for continuing to develop our strategies. Um, the key strategies that we are tasked with reporting on each year and that really guide our work throughout each year um, are going to be our strategies to reduce the number of persons that experience first-time homelessness. Um, we can't necessarily um, always predict a strategy that's going to reduce our overall numbers of homelessness. We have to kind of break it down and look at different areas. One thing is how do we prevent people from ever experiencing homelessness? Um, we want to examine the number of persons that we're seeing within our system who haven't previously accessed shelter or programs, and how can we identify risk factors and develop solutions. We are looking to reduce the amount of time that persons experience homelessness when they do experience it. How can we make it so that they have a more rapid recovery and, and return to permanent housing? We want to make sure that our programs are as effective as possible at increasing our permanent housing exits. We want to see that when people leave our housing programs, that ideally it is to continue um, residing in permanent housing and not to exit to negative destinations like the streets, um, shelter. We want to move people forward, not backward. Additionally, we want to make sure that when folks do exit, um, and it's to a positive destination, that they have the tools and the resources that they need in order to remain permanently housed. So we look at who's gonna return to our system at six months, 12 months, and 24 months, and we need to understand how do we best equip people so that we don't see them back in our system. We develop a lot of relationships with those that we serve, but ideally the circumstances under which we would see them again are not gonna be a return to homelessness. And then we also, as part of uh, multiple different aspects of these strategies, we want to examine how we can increase income. Um, that would be both employment and non-employment income. So how can we help persons to get jobs and keep jobs? How can we help persons to access mainstream benefits, whether that be SSI, SSDI, food stamps, or other resources that might be available to them?